Good evening. Uh, welcome to Tuesday Talks at the Atwood. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Wright. I'm the executive director here at the Atwood Museum, and we're very excited to have our, our talk tonight. Uh, before I introduce uh, Allison, uh, I want to talk a few housekeeping items about the museum. Um, our, just so everyone knows, our next talk uh, will be uh, coming up on April 11th. Uh, so for those of you who enjoy uh, mushroom foraging, uh, you have an opportunity. Our speaker then will be Tyler Akaban, uh, and we're really looking forward to that. That too will be a virtual lecture. Uh, and then when we get into May, we'll get back into our in-person lectures. Um, but uh, for right now, tonight's and uh, next month will be a virtual uh, through Zoom. Uh, coming up, uh, obviously, if, you, if you're unaware, I'm pretty sure I've said it a few times, uh, this is our 100th anniversary. So we're very excited at the Chatham Historical Society. And uh, um, so mark your calendar for May 5th. Uh, that's when the museum officially opens. Uh, and uh, we're very excited um, uh, for this year. We have two new exhibits. Uh, one that sort of highlights uh, the museum through the last hundred years. Uh, we have another uh, exhibit uh, called the uh, Land Ho, uh, the Chatham Shipping and uh, Fishing Community. So that's very exciting. And we're also very uh, thrilled to be opening a uh, multimedia uh, room this year. So uh, that's uh, something that's been uh, a passion of mine for the last few years, and uh, it will come about this year. Uh, and you can't have a media room without a nice uh, documentary. And uh, we're in the process of right now having a, a new documentary produced about the life of Alice Stolnik. Uh, we anticipate that to be done around May as well. So keep checking our, our website for that and all those details because it's kind of exciting. So a lot of things going on. We're very excited and we're very grateful for you to, to join us this evening. Um, if you have questions for uh, Allison uh, during the uh, the lecture, please put them into the Q and A field at the bottom of your Zoom, uh, and then uh, if, if if it makes sense, she'll she'll will ask some questions during the lecture. But most of the questions will be held to the end of the lecture. Uh, then Allison will try to answer as many questions as possible. So that's really good. Um, and if you are enjoying this lecture and all our other lectures, if you uh, uh, so inclined to donate money to the Atwood Museum. Uh, Christina is going to be putting in a donate link uh, in the, the chat. Uh, your help is uh, is always grateful, uh, especially in this 100th anniversary where he's looking forward to. So now let me introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Allison is a regenerative growing consultant, author, and educator on a variety of organic gardening topics, eco ecological design, and climate resiliency. She is also the author of The Carbon Sequestering Garden, Gardening for the Planet While Growing Some of the Best Food Possible. That's a free publication published by the Northeast Organic Farming Association. Currently living in Philadelphia, Allison also runs an online consulting community to su support people in building thriving, diverse, and resilient backyards and gardens. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Allison Houghton. Hello, so great to be here. I'm really excited about this presentation. It's a topic that I really love, and I uh, can't wait to get started. So let me let me share my screen. Here we go. All right. And let's see. All right. So great to, to be here. Um, my uh, topic or what I'm gonna be talking about today is this idea of growing resilience and tapping into this enormous potential that is right in your backyard. Um, so uh, the first, um, what I'll be talking about to start with is a little bit about soil, I'll dive into water, um, and then a little bit about plants in terms of different ways that your garden has impacts um, or what you can impact uh, the resiliency of your, your garden or space. Um, so, Starting with the soil, I'll just dive right in. Um, I think soil is incredible. Um, it is, there's so many different ways that you can read your landscape um, and learn about your landscape, starting with the soil. So looking at what's there and how, um, what color it is, what texture it is. Is it really compacted? Is it sandy? Um, is it very loamy, nice and, and fluffy and, and easy to grow in or, or not? So, and there's a lot of aspects of those characteristics that really add to resilience or not in a landscape. So 
So start off, uh, one thing that you can do right in your backyard and just start and see what your soil looks like. This is an example of a soil probe right on the right here. And um, you'll just notice that the um, top soil on the very top, it's a little bit of a darker color. Um, and the um, and then the subsoil is oftentimes a little bit lighter. It can be, it depends on the soil and where, um, it depends on where, what type of soil you have. You can be different colors and everything, but this top layer of soil, that is where there's an enormous amount of potential. So many urban spaces, many gardens actually throughout the state um, have uh, soils that are um, degraded or any number of different things. And there's a potential right there in that topsoil and then also the subsoil underneath to really build up resilience of, of the area. Um, here we go. So looking into this, um, when you grow soil, you are growing resilience. So what does that mean? There, when you have, when you grow and build that color, that depth uh, of that topsoil, you are capturing carbon. You are holding way more water in the soil. It's an unbelievable sponge-like structure. You're increasing the biodiversity below ground, which in turn feeds biodiversity above ground. And so you're really increasing the biodiversity of the entire ecological system. You are increasing the soil's ability to hold hold on to nutrients. So you're essentially increasing the bank account for your soil. So the amount of nutrients that uh, the soil is able to hold on to, that's, you're increasing that. Um, you are also growing um, when your soil is a rich and thriving and biodiverse, full of microbes and all sorts of things, you can access more nutrients. Um, and you in turn grow more nutrient dense vegetables as well when you have this thriving back and forth between plants and, and the soil. You also have this incredible capacity to filter and break down toxins. Um, that is uh, binding up heavy metals, that is breaking down organic pollutants, things that are really challenging. There are fungi that can literally, they produce enzymes that rip apart uh, organic pollutants, things like DDT or hydrocarbons uh, and into inert compounds. So there's some amazing stuff that's happening in the soil. And uh, the more you build this up, the more you uh, increase resilience in your backyard and your space. And so I, I, I love the topic of soil. I think it is so exciting to look it into it. And it's oftentimes something we don't really think about because it's under our feet. We walk past it every day. Uh, but I just want to, I'll go through a couple different examples of ways you can start to notice whether your soil is experiencing health or not and opportunities or leverage points that you can do to really increase uh, resilience in your backyard, but also whether for growing more nutrient dense vegetables or uh, higher quality uh, plants that bloom more, that have higher nutrient content for bees or, or other animals, or um, also just supporting neighborhood community uh, ecologically or also for your watershed. So there's a lot of different opportunities right in your backyard for um, creating gardens that really can support a region and increase the resilience in a region. So um, I, my background was in geology and civil environmental engineering. And I had always heard that it took um, over a hundred thousand years uh, to grow an inch of topsoil. This is this older idea. And this was an older paradigm that we understood about soil. And, and when you lose it, um, you pretty much lost it. That was the, the kind of understanding that I had always been taught. And over the past couple of years, I have been diving into, um, and I will share these links actually in the chat as well, so you can have them and feel free to, to go check them out whenever you, you want to. But um, they there are so many opportunities for um, building soil, and it can happen much, much more rapidly than we have thought possible. So these are these uh, links in here. Let me just see if it goes. Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, but this is a, this is just a very exciting. Oh, hold on a minute. My screen sharing is paused. Do you all see? Still see my screen? Just want to double check. Oh, one second. Let me pull that up again. There we go. Excellent. Okay. I think that's going there. Uh, but it's possible actually to grow soil much, much, much faster than we've ever thought possible. So soil building can happen really, really rapidly. And it can happen in the matter of a few years. Some people can grow soil very fast, uh, six months. Like it's, it's, it's incredible actually when we start incorporating these ideas that we have started to understand about adding biology into the soil building process suddenly, 
the possibilities are, are really incredible for how to build soil very rapidly and increase resilience in an ecosystem. So these are just a couple different examples um, around the world um, of people who have built soil rapidly, some large context, some small. So check it out when you get a chance. I try to do short ones so that they're easy to, to digest. But um, so soils near and far. Uh, there are a lot of examples where we've seen of like desertified landscapes and like massive soil erosion. And so that's that's oftentimes when we think of soil erosion as a limited resource, we think about it from that perspective. But there's actually a lot of examples of um, impeded nutrient cycles or um, degraded soils in and around our areas as well. And so starting to notice what soils look like right in your area and what are signs of health and not health. So for example, if you are looking at an area and you see very, very limited uh, or staggered growth, a um, lot of rocks exposed, for example, on the sur soil surface, then there's a lot of erosion most likely happening at that space. Uh, you might have a lot of like maybe rainfall or water washing away the silt or soil. So there's not a lot of being held in place. That means that there's a lot of more erosion and less um, soil being maintained on that landscape. Um, also, if you notice a lot of invasive plants, for example, a lot of invasive plants or weeds or other things tend to grow in response to large disturbances. And so weeds, one of their roles is to stabilize and establish and cover soil really rapidly. So if there's a lot of disturbance, if there's a lot of heat or cracked soil or uh, nutrient depletion or other things, weeds and other things are trying to uh, protect that soil surface. And so that's their role. Um, and, and then, so that it's actually, they're kind of amazing. Here's a, an example of um, a plant popping through a crack in the sidewalk. And you'll notice that there's not a lot of chance for this to um, water to infiltrate. Um, so it's actually kind of astounding that it's able to survive there. And, uh, and there's a lot of really cool microbiology that goes into soil building at those root tips. And the plant is actually farming microbes at its root tips to get the nutrients it needs. It's amazing. Um, but noticing that and noticing where that's happening and trying to encourage um, that succession to happen quickly, um, you actually can, can build soil very, very rapidly. Um, this picture on the, the top right, uh, the reason I added in here, this is an area, and you'll kind of notice that these tree roots are really exposed. So they're kind of up. At one point, the soil was actually at the level of some of these, uh, where kind of where the roots are, and they were, it was actually much higher up, and it's been eroding over time. And one thing you'll also notice is there's a lot of moss. So one one of the things that tells me is that there's a lot of moisture. So there's probably the soil is fairly compacted. It's also eroding. And then there's also a lot of moisture. So not a lot of root, the roots can't get down very deep. Um, they're mostly on the surface. You're getting moss. So it's a, probably um, gets flooded a lot and you get this kind of funky um, system. So these trees are probably a little bit stressed, uh, but just noticing what the soil is doing, what does it look like and how, how is this happening? What, what's happening in these areas? So Many of you know you need really good soil to grow good plants, but a much lesser known idea is that plants are actually really helpful in growing good soils. So plants are our allies in soil building. And that gets very exciting very quickly because we get to work alongside a lot of these um, systems that are really good at growing soil. So we're just essentially as gardeners or as uh, land stewards, helping to create these systems and make them thrive. And so that's that's our main goal. Um, so how does this work? Plants, they photosynthesize. Um, you've all probably heard this from chemistry class classes of days past, but essentially what they do is they take sunlight and water and carbon dioxide, and you'll notice the carbon and carbon dioxide, and they'll turn them into, uh, through the process of photosynthesis, into sugar and sugars and oxygen. And so sugar, if you notice, has a lot of carbon in it. Um, so this is a really valuable resource. The plant produces a lot of this. And so if you think about sugar as liquid carbon, that's kind of what it's, what's doing. It fuels much of the systems, much of what's happening inside the plant. And so as this plant is photosynthesizing, it is creating these sugars and, you know, of course, feeding the leaves, feeding the roots. But the thing that's really interesting, and many of you may know this, is that plants actually leak an ex a lot of these sugars out through their roots. Some plants leak, um, leak over half of their sugars out through their roots. So this is a very valuable resource. And why would a plant just be 
oozing that out into the soil? Well, the reason is they're feeding an enormous uh, quantity of microbes. And so these microbes are amazing. They have this capacity to produce compounds, to access nutrients, to make nutrients digestible for plants and give the plant exactly what it needs when it needs it in exchange for these sugars. And so it's like this digestive systems, like a microbiome for the plant roots, just like our own microbiome is for us. It helps us kind of digest and maintain health. And then it also helps, um, if the plant has a disease response um, or, or is struggling with something, it they can target specific compounds to help the plant deal with uh, some of these stressors. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing. Another really cool part of this is mycorrhizal fungi. So there are these beneficial fungi that attach to the plant roots and they extend the reach of the plants many, many, many fold. Like it's, it's, it's incredible how much they can connect plants to each other. They can connect plants um, to resources, other things. They can even mine rocks. Um, it's amazing. And, um, and so these are nutrients that the mycorrhizal fungi are accessing inside rocks that are not accessible or not um, visible. When you take a soil test, these will not show up on a soil test. So you're essentially tapping into this resource base that um, with the help of these microbes and beneficial fungi and this whole soil food web that the plant would not otherwise have. And if you go a step further and you say mulch, you're kind of protecting that soil surface. You're keeping it nice and cool, helpful for those microbes. You're feeding them a carbon source and you are also encouraging more and more of this soil building. So this is this incredible system. And if we can just figure out ways to support it, then that is, um, that's huge. That can make a huge difference. And this is kind of where those resilience, like being able to build soil can help you build resilience. So what does resilience look like? Aggregates. Aggregates are uh, basically these little tiny clumps of soil that are held together by glues and slimes and like microbes living and dying and breaking down. Uh, the fungi actually produce uh, this really interesting sticky carbon rich glue. And it's a, like a long-term carbon source. Like it's a sticky thing that stays around in the soil and it helps create soil structure. And so this is these are loose clumps so that if you were to kind of smush them, they sort of fall apart, they crumble into smaller clumps. So they kind of are a light, um, they're, they don't, they're not hard, they're not solid. So they hold air and they hold water simultaneously. So they're very much like sponge structures um, and they, they do incredible things to add resilience to a landscape. So I'm gonna see if this works. Okay, so I'm gonna show you just a, a very short video that is just gonna show you an example between an aggregate and a, a soil clod and what it does. And hopefully this will come through. I'm gonna let it, I think this is, we'll see, we'll see if I can let it load. Here we go. And this is just to show you kind of what resilience looks like in a landscape from looking at these two different examples. So I'm gonna show you the slake test. The slake test, this is a homemade version. So these are two containers, you can use mason jars and then these are fabric, or the mesh that come around citrus in the grocery store. There's two different ones here. So this is what I think will be a nice aggregate. And then this one's more of a soil clod and we'll just see. So you put it in there and does it hold up to water? So this one looks like it is kind of breaking down a little bit. We'll see, we'll just leave it in there. And so this is another one and we're gonna try it. We're gonna plop it in here and just see what it does. Actually, there you go. That is kind of amazing. So this one was, an aggregate that had the soil structure and this was just kind of that more compressed compacted soil and you'll notice it's still falling so when water hits it this is what happens raindrops will burst it apart it has a really hard time holding its shape it'll be more susceptible to wind and water erosion whereas this one right here we're losing some bubbles at the top but it is mainly staying put. So this was one of the aggregates that was around those roots. And you can see it has a clump shape. It is dropped, you know, maybe a little bit of soil, but nothing like this one, which is still dropping and kind of falling apart. The difference between soil biology and 
soil that doesn't have that soil structure, that doesn't have living glues and slimes that sort of hold it together, it makes a huge difference. This one acts as a sponge in the soil. It'll hold water. It will, in the drought, it'll hold on to water in these little pores, whereas this one will kind of harden up. This will crack. It'll have a lot of problems. Again, this is, uh, if you take this one versus if you take that one, it's just incredible how stable this one is. Nothing quite like this. If you, I don't know if you can see this at the bottom how much soil has actually dropped down. Soil biology in action. So it's been about four days and this is what the aggregate looks like that was still there. So it's still holding together even though it's really hard for a, an aggregate to stay submerged for that long. And then this one, you'll notice it's mostly stuck on the bottom. So I just emptied the water out, but there's still a lot of the soil silt below. Here, if I pull it out, let's see. So the difference is quite extreme. And you can see the difference between resilience and non-resilience. is the slake test, which is very cool. You can try it out if you want to test and see what your aggregates are made of. Um, it's a really fun test to do. And it's amazing how much resilience is possible in an area happening underground. And again, that's through the support of plants as well. So um, going into some of those details, I talked a little bit about the very end of that video about the principles for soil building. So the, the gist of it is soil is alive. And, um, and there's a lot of forces that kind of act on it. So things like rain, raindrops are extremely harsh on soil. So when they hit the ground, they impact the, the surface of the soil quite a bit. Um, they wash things away, they wash silt and all that mineral, all those components, they can wash them away very quickly. The sun bakes them, makes it hot. So when you have all these temperature extremes and wind and all these other pieces acting on soil surface, it's really tricky for that living soil to kind of add that resilience and build up. And it, it's, it, they kind of, uh, the microbes shy away from that, those harsher environments. They like um, uh, things like if you've ever made yogurt, you want to keep the temperature very, very steady at a nice warm, but not, not too cold, not too hot. Um, but in this nice steady environment. So the challenge is soil biology is very, very complex, but luckily for us, uh, soil building principles are actually quite simple. Um, so um, the first one that I talked about is keeping soil covered and protected. So you're thinking about making an armor for your soil. These are based on the National Resource Conservation Services uh, principles for building soil health. Um, and so you're keeping your soil covered, protected, getting really creative with different types of mulch. If you're able to have mulches be like a great carbon source, things like hay or straw or buckwheat holes or rice holes or um, sticks, like you maybe... Uh, there's lots of different options. You can grow your own mulch. Uh, there's many, many different things. And we'll talk about, a little bit about some of those options a little bit later on. Um, but there's lots of different ways to keep the soil covered. Remember, you're protecting it. Um, you can also keep it covered with a living ground cover as well. So those are like, for example, a one that I love seeing is people put mint sometimes under rain gutters. And, um, and it just, mint is a very strong, aggressive growing plant. And it just it smells like mint um, when it rains. And so it, it's very good at keeping things covered and protected. So that's just one, one example. Um, the next is minimizing disturbance. So uh, every time you dig into the soil, you kind of disrupt these communities. And so when you are trying to encourage this environment, you want to, as much as possible, uh, reduce disturbance. And so disturbance could be physical. So that's, again, digging. Um, or, or maybe wind or cold or temperature. So again, protecting and keeping minimizing that disturbance. And then it also could be um, uh, chemical. So for example, like, um, you know, uh, one classic example are pesticides. So oftentimes when you put a fungicide 
on the, on the plant, you are also affecting fungi in the soil and disrupting those in, uh, relationships. Another one that a lot of people don't think about are synthetic fertilizers. So synthetic fertilizers are they're the ones that show up like miracle Grow or other things. They actually are really, they like have a very high numbers, NPK numbers, like 20, 20, 20. Um, they are really intense on soil structure. So some of them um, prematurely weather soils, they drive away microbiology because they're very acidic um, or basic, depending on which ones they are, but they're often salts. They drive away earthworms. Um, they can break down soil structure. They can leach out carbon or oxidize. They can strip out calcium from your soils. Um, so that's like oftentimes nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizers that are just pure, like oftentimes are bright colored blue or white or other things. Um, so what I do, if I'm adding a fertilizer, I'll try to do an, uh, an organic fertilizer. So an all-purpose organic amendment or some, something along those lines, rock dusts, uh, sea, sea products, other things like that. Um, but so that can, is much gentler on the soil. It doesn't have that harsh uh, impact. So that's one other way to minimize disturbance. Um, also with, um, I'll just mention with digging, um, oftentimes you don't want to dig However, if you have really compacted soil where no water and air is getting in there, it is actually really important to first loosen up that compaction so you're getting air and water and biology down there first, and then you can kind of let that happen. So you're trying to maximize the conditions for life, and that's that's the main um, challenge. So if you're if you're digging, just kind of find ways to minimize digging. If you're weeding. Um, figuring out ways to kind of minimizing disturbance of the soil. It doesn't mean you don't ever dig to plant. It just means you're trying to minimize that and just be mindful of all this community underground. Um, living roots, uh, in keeping living roots in the soil for as much of the year as possible. So maybe considering perennial vegetables. This is, these are, remember plants are our allies. And so we're trying to take, um, this incredible harnessing capacity of sunlight, solar panel, these plants essentially have solar panels for leaves and they're pulling in all this energy and uh, and converting it into sugars from the sun and, and feeding this underground, like fueling this micro microbiology underground, this underground ecosystem. And so trying to keep those in the ground as much as possible at the end of the year, if you're clearing out a garden, chopping things down right at um, ground level and leaving the roots in the soil for the microbes to continue to eat. Uh, that's a really important thing just to keep that soil structure building. So trying to give them as food sources for as much of the year as possible. Uh, another one is to plant diversity above ground to add diversity below ground. So the more every single plant has a unique signature of microbes at its base that it supports. And so the more variety you have above ground, the more diversity you have below ground. And if you get enough variety, sometimes you get these compounding benefits where if uh, certain beneficial bacteria go above a certain threshold, they suddenly turn on various functions and the resilience and quality of the plants goes way up. So indicators that you are doing that well are plants that have really shiny, vibrant leaves. Shiny leaves are oftentimes an indicator of the plants being able to produce lipids, which are not only helping with disease resistance, but they're also helping like preventing fungal pathogens or preventing insects even from, from eating them. But they're also kind of an indicator that you can see also limber, um, uh, strong, but, um, but kind of bendable stems, like bright colors in the plants, um, fruit ripening all at once on a, on a vine, things like that. There's a couple different indicators for really, really strong growth on plants. And so you want your plants to be glowing. Um, and this also makes gardening really fun because you're, dealing less with pests and diseases, which is great. Um, and then the last one that um, is in here is incorporating animals as nutrient cyclers. So uh, a lot of people are like, well, I don't have chickens or there's no way I can add in various things. It doesn't have to be big. Like a bacteria is totally a nutrient cycler. So essentially you are incorporating as much of the soil food web as you can. So for example, a little bacteria, when it gets eaten by a larger protozoa in the soil, it literally is like ripping open a fertilizer bag. So it became, the more nutrient cycling and earthworms will eat protozoa and like all these different creatures, the more they are eating and dying and, and recycling things, the more you're unlocking nutrients for your plants. And so the more complex your microbes in your soil are, the more nutrients and the more complex compounds you're unlocking 
um, for your plants as well. So you get this really interesting, amazing effect. And some of these microbes have this unbelievable capacity to bind up and um, and and process toxic compounds or heavy metals or other things. And so you get some really amazing effects if you can get this soil food web kind of really um, robust and thriving. Um, this is just one example of how you might grow soil. Um, this is an example called lasagna mulch, and it's basically just growing, uh, putting different layers on top. So you're alternating carbon-ish sources. So these are, tend to be brown materials with nitrogen-esque sources, which tend to be like greenish materials, grass clippings. I mean, in this case, you know, manure is also a pretty high nitrogen source. So anyway, you're alternating those two things. It doesn't have to be a perfect ratio. Um, one thing I will mention, some people do this actually with um, just compost and wood chips layered on top of each other, and they can build and grow soil on top of asphalt. Um, so that's possible. Um, you, you can literally grow soil very quickly. Uh, but one thing that I will mention is if you're using wood chips, uh, just do not, again, no disturbance. They work if you do not churn up the soil. If you churn up the soil, you trigger, um, it, it kind of leaches, it seizes up the nitrogen in the soil because uh, the wood chips need nitrogen to break down unless they're very stationary and then your fungi can eat them for you. So um, you, if you're using like a lot of carbon, heavy, heavy carbon materials, just again, the no dig or the minimal uh, disturbance is really important to get that to succeed. Um, so talking a little bit more about um, water. Uh, water, as we've talked about a little bit before, you, how do you um, really utilize water in your landscape. Water, if you worked well, can really make a huge difference in resilience in your landscape. Not only is it pulling um, your uh, water uh, every time it rains, instead of water rushing off your landscape into the watershed, creating flooding or other things. Um, and what I mean by watershed is when water lands on your space and goes off of your land, it goes into ultimately a river system. And the land that is uh, fills a certain river is called that wa uh, watershed. And so you're, you can look up your watershed. It's really fun to, to learn what, uh, what you're impacting um, as water rushes off your space or what you're protecting um, by doing that. And, um, and you can do a lot of really incredible things. But if from a resilience standpoint, um, you can sink slow, and capture as much water as you possibly can. Um, and it can not only have a, a rebounding effect in terms of that biology and that support, but it, it's, a, it's really helpful for, um, for supporting uh, those landscapes. Um, so a fascinating fact that is really cool is that for every 1% increase in organic matter, so you'll remember that dark, dark soil if you have, say, degraded soil, every time you increase that dark, you make it a little bit darker, you increase that organic matter content in the top six inches of your soil um, by 1%, and you can measure this on a soil test, you actually increase the water holding capacity of that soil by 27,000 gallons per acre. And so acres are hard to imagine for a backyard context, so I just wanted to break that out, but for a 10 by 10 foot garden space, um, and you can imagine 10 feet by 10 feet, that is one full 55 gallon rain barrel worth of water more that's being held in the soil for each increase, 1% increase in organic matter. Um, also, the um, so if you were to increase that, so say you have a 20 foot by 50 foot yard or garden. And again, think about areas that have low organic matter that are like the soil is really light colored. It doesn't, it's, it's, you know, maybe compacted or other things. If you can increase that organic matter, just a tiny amount, you actually go from one to 11, uh, 55 gallon rain barrels, and then doing it one step further, an eighth of an acre, which isn't a massive, it's a big space in a city, um, but it's not a huge space. Uh, there's a lot of yards that are that size, um, but that is 61 55 gallon rain barrels, more water for that 1% increase in organic matter. So this is enormous resilience potential. And just to put this into context, um, the Great Plains used to have between about six and 10% organic matter in the soils. And now on average, we have a between like zero and 2%. Uh, the way we farm, we tend to burn up organic matter, just the way 
the way it's happening. Um, but if you think about all the amount of water across the entire Great Plains, that's the amount of water held in soil is really difficult to measure, but that's astounding. <laughs> you know, it's it's the amount of potential in landscapes, especially degraded soils, uh, for increasing organic matter and then being able to hold water. Talk about resiliency in a region. You can do incredible amounts with that. And so that's just um just one example of how soil can act like a sponge and and really build soil. So one technique that is great for building that spongy soil is something called hugel culture. And it's basically buried wood and the wood breaks down, stays in place, and it essentially creates this very spongy soil. So if you think about a forest, when a tree is kind of falling against the soil and it literally just peels apart, that is what we're talking about. That's like wood turned to sponge soil. Um, that is what we're trying to do. And so this is a, a technique that's oftentimes you see it mounded, but this is, imagine like a street corner garden, you could dig down and layer wood at the bottom and then layers of say compost and leaf and other, other things that kind of layer it up um, kind of on these edges, you can actually build soil or incorporate these pieces into soil and create a much, much more resilient uh, landscape that has to be maintained far less than uh, something that has a very short, shallow, not a lot of sponge. So this is uh, just one technique, one example of a way to build resilience very quickly in a landscape using materials like logs or wood chips or branches that are oftentimes considered uh, waste materials in the landscape. Um, this is a this is a home example, just looking at say a, a backyard. This is again, leaf brush pile. Um, so when I'm looking at this landscape, I'm looking for where water runs. So again, look at the gutters, look, notice when it rains, where is there water accumulating and where is it just racing off your landscape? And if you can then shift and start to incorporate that um, into, uh, uh, you know, reinvesting and reaccumulating that water into your, if you can capture every single drop that falls onto your landscape and reinvest it into your space, what would that look like? So here's just one example. So one thing is you might, uh, you might build a rain garden. Um, so that is a, a one potential way that you can sink it. So again, creating a depression, putting uh, hardy plants in there that can handle some water, um, and then, you know, creating a border or something to make it look really nice and intentional um, can be a really great option. Um, let me just see how I'm doing time-wise. Okay. And then another option is something like, so for example, you'll notice actually in this slide beforehand, um, this is an area that, uh, this is a tree on the south facing side of the garden. It's like, you know, oftentimes under trees, there's like compacted soil, nothing grows there, shade is, you know, it's just, it's tricky. You could, if you wanted to do something like a uh, French drainage dick technique, which is basically dig out a trench, fill it with rocks or something that like, so this is in say like compacted soil, fill it with rocks or something loose that allows the water, redirect that water and then cover it over with soil and replant it. So it could just be seamlessly into the lawn, but redirecting water into a certain area that you want it to go. So that is one option. You could have somehow like Google culture beds, for example, that block the flow of water and then reinvest that into the landscape. Um, you could, in this case, what if you did say a permeable driveway or took resources that are coming from inside your house, like say compost, and then started using that to um, really build the, um, the organic matter content of your soils. Um, another, again, continuing to reinvest like permeable driveway, you're starting to see that the water is sort of adding in there, adding a lot of different perennial plants. So again, creating deeper root systems that allow you to really invest in those spaces and then suck water down. Um, and maybe you're kind of texturing the landscape in such a way to keep and hold water in place. Um, and then again, like um, using uh, as this sort of system grows, you could also be incorporating something like, you know, rain barrels or uh, vegetable garden space or other other things that work for your space. So these are all different options. This is a theoretical example. But again, think really creatively about how do you reinvest these resources that are already coming onto your space and then just maximize um, the potential um, for for your space. Um, and I just want to double check. Let's see. Okay, I will pull these things. Oops, here we go. Let me pull this off. Okay, there we go. Um, 
There we go. All right. So plants as allies. Plants, last section of this, I just want to talk a little bit about how um, plants can really be allies in your landscape. So um, you'll notice this little guy right here, this Kentucky bluegrass. This is the, the plant variety that is most commonly uh, the grass type that lawns are made of. Um, it is actually not from Kentucky. It is not native to the United States. It's just renamed to kind of fit in a little bit more, but it is actually not very well adapted to our landscape. Um, it's actually a uh, European variety and um, it tends to have really short root systems. So again, the roots, it's, it's <laughs> you know, and like compared to so many native plants, including grasses that actually have really deep, incredible root systems. So for example, you know, we've all seen prairie plants, uh, pictures of prairie plants where they have just insane root systems, sometimes as deep as 15 feet or more. Uh, these are prairie plants that have incredible benefits, um, both for pollinators, for landscapes, um, and are also a lot of them are uh, medicinal plants, uh, things like echinacea or vervain or all of these different things that actually are really incredibly beneficial on many levels ecologically and for us as well. Um, so uh, these complementary root systems, you're essentially growing an underground forest. So really thinking about how you can incorporate plants as allies. And oftentimes what I like to do is I like to put plants with deeper root systems. If you, you know, don't have, you're not able to maybe plant directly into your yard, or maybe if you have a lawn, you could diversify the lawn or you could um, plant like key things, things like uh, this is a prairie drop seed. It's this beautiful native grass. It's clumping. It's a warm season grass. And so it creates this beautiful texture in the wintertime. It's um, a host plant for endangered skipper butterflies. It is uh, great for ground nesting bees. These are non-aggressive bees that are wonderful pollinators. And they also anchor the landscape. And so corners of landscapes, or if you see an area with erosion, it, they're amazing. So um, also the seeds were eaten uh, by uh, Native Americans um, or ground up into a kind of a flower source as well. So these are like incredible, amazing, wonderful plants that are all around us that we know very often it's very little about. Um, and so we can incorporate those more into our landscapes uh, uh, to really add a lot of um, amazing uh, texture and diversity as well. So I'm going to talk about a couple different categories of plants and one of them actually and just real quick there are every single plant a lot of native plants especially have our host plants for specific types of insects and the more we increase the kind of diversity of these species the more we can increase also the insect diversity and that in turn supports the next level um, of birds, it includes mammals. Uh, foxes, for example, have a huge amount of their diet is actually insect protein, who knew? Um, same with even like bears, <laughs> uh, all sorts of different things eat insects because it's a really, really high quality protein and that insects are directly proportional to, the number of insects is directly proportional to the health of ecosystems. So I'm a huge fan of, of, um, of beneficial bugs. Uh, and then these are like the ma high majority of insects are um, ones you don't even notice or are, are not even like, they're just humbly working and digesting and recycling and doing all these different things. And when their populations are high enough and diverse enough, then you get, uh, they keep in check pests that we know of like houseflies or mosquitoes or all these other pieces, slugs or other, other things, they keep them in check. And so, um, so having a diversity really does keep uh, pest numbers down. If you don't have a diversity, their pest numbers go way up because they reproduce really rapidly. Um, anyway, so this is one example of a class of plants that I think of as soil builders. So these are cover crops. Any gardener can use them. So a lot of times cover crops are used in farm settings for specific purposes. These three are just three examples of cover crops that I love. They are edible as shoot, you know, as shoots, especially these uh, small sizes before they get too big. And they are a way for you to grow soil and grow your own mulch and also produce a harvest. Um, so awesome plants. Um, the reason I like these guys, these are annual plants um, and they're really, really easy for backyard gardeners to use. So you can sprinkle in, so soak the seeds or just use them and sprinkle them in. And so for example, peas grow great in the springtime. Peas and radish are very nice, cool weather crops. They love growing. You can grow them rapidly. You can grow a ton of them. And 
they, um, they build your soil. And then as soon as they're sort of done growing, you can either chop them off um, and leave the leftover like on the, on the soil surface. You can eat them or you can leave that leftover on the soil surface as mulch. So they're a really wonderful way to do that. Buckwheat is an example of a warm weather crop. So it grows really, really well in the warm, hot summer. And it's an excellent um, ground cover um, anytime. Again, these are edible. They're just wonderful. And uh, buckwheat, as it gets older, uh, it's less edible, but um, at least the leaves, but they're, um, the, the flowers are amazing for pollinators as well. It's a great nectar source. So again, these are, all of these plants have specific roles. Peas are used by farmers oftentimes to fix nitrogen in the soil. Radishes have this incredible um, weed suppressing effect in the soil. So if you grow a round of radishes, um, they have this very temporary, localized, very subtle effect of suppressing weeds. And so they're really wonderful for planting transplants into uh, growing over the winter. You could plant these in the fall and let the winter kill them back. And then you have a fresh growing space in the, in the springtime to grow into. So um, wonderful plants, uh, and they can be allies for you in soil building. They grow really quickly. Um, there's also a class of plants that are, I think of as earth repairers or uh, recovers. So as soil goes from very low organic matter and it increases and gets more complex and more diversity in it, it increases. So it starts off very bacterially dominant. Bacteria multiply quickly. They're, they're fast. They're the ones that kind of get the nutrients cycling. And as soils age and get more mature and kind of think old growth forest, they become much more fungally dominant. And there's everything in between as you kind of build fungal dominance over time. Um, so weeds are oftentimes, they are wonderful. They're hyperaccumulators of nutrients. They, one of their roles is to bring attract animals in and also accumulate certain nutrients so that they can then um, build up those nutrients that the soil is lacking in uh, in the soil. So oftentimes they're mineral accumulators. Um, so things like dandelion, dandelion is a hyper, it has a very deep tap root. It's really good at puncturing through compaction layers. And it's also accumulates things like calcium. So ironically, a lot of nitrogen fertilizers strip out calcium from the soil. We tend to throw a lot of nitrogen fertilizers on lawns, um, which strips out calcium, which encourages more dandelions, which is just, it's just, you know, it's kind of a funny cycle um, of how we can get into those things where it's really, if you um, corrected the calcium and also compaction, you actually, you decrease, you basically eliminate the conditions in which those weeds thrive. So weeds um, also, and I just want to make check time. Okay, doing. I'm just going to finish up this bit, and then I'll uh, open it up for questions. Um, but they are are incredible for for doing some of these different pieces and and making sure that landscapes um, by bringing in nutrients, by bringing cycling things. If you have a dandelion in the middle of a bare area, um, it actually is bringing its like seeds. It's encouraging um, nutrient cyclers. Uh, all those different pieces coming in, all the animals that come for these first succession weeds um, can really make a big difference. All these are edible as well. So chickweed is a, a it rivals spinach in nutrient content. Um, and it's an amazing um, edible, but also um, early succession plant. So it's a, it'll respond to highly bacterially dominant situations. So if you can increase the fungal dominance, you actually decrease the, this kind of the conditions for these weeds to thrive. So they disappear, they can disappear on their own. Um, there's another set of plants that I think of as ecosystem fuelers. So things like classic one are oaks. I've mentioned the prairie drop seed before, but oak is, it has one of the highest uh, out of all, like all these trees, it's kind of like a keystone tree um, for the number of caterpillar species that feed on oak specifically. And so if you look in the springtime and see warblers coming through and migrating through, they love oaks <laughs> um, because there's so many different types of species of caterpillars. Things like mountain mint or other meadow wildflower are wonderful nectar sources. They're incredible at fueling different types of things. So having some of these ecosystem fuelers that are either food sources or nectar sources for throughout the season that are available um, for, for you, your ecosystem can really boost the resilience and, and quality. So for example, having a mountain mint near a vegetable garden is amazing in terms of um, resilience. 
uh, in, from beneficial insects, all these different pieces. So you, you really have these little guardians of your, of your garden or, or space um, and your pest pressure goes way down. Um, and then this is um, just also, we have huge numbers of perennial vegetables and, um, and fruits and other things that we've just kind of forgotten about. And so some of these have amazing flavors. Um, the papa is uh, one of uh, North America's largest native fruits and it is a host plant for the zebra swallowtail. It's, uh, it's just fascinating that uh, all these different pieces. Um, and then also things like American elderberry. Elderberry gets used a lot in uh, Europe and also um, in, um, in uh, uh, I, in Europe, um, actually, we imported it we, over during COVID. Have imported an enormous amount of elderberry um, because it has a lot of compounds that help with immune support. But the University of Missouri has been studying American elderberry, which has been kind of ignored for a very long time as just a, oh, it's a wildlife plant. But it actually has way more of the compounds, these beneficial compounds, than the European elderberry does. So we could be growing these things right in our backyards. Uh, Hawthorne also is a, a recently people have talked about it a little bit. It's been in studies for heart disease specifically and supporting in that. So there's all these different plants and flavors and other things that are really beneficial for human health and they just taste good. And um, and actually I think I'm going to the last, yeah, actually I'll, I'll I think I'll, I'll pause it there, um, but I just wanted to end with this piece of what does resilience look like right in your backyard? And how do you look at your space and decide kind of what, is possible right in your backyard. And I'm just gonna leave with this quote. I can tell you about my, yeah, there we go. Um, there we go. I was gonna leave this quote with the Vantana Shiva, which is just fantastic. So um, yeah, she basically says, um, you know, sometimes when there's the bigness of all that there is out there, starting and focusing right where you are is a way, that in itself is a way to um, enlarge your potential. Um, right where you are. So I will leave it at that. And Allison, very nice. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, I love your enthusiasm uh, about the, the topic and soil. Uh, that's very, very exciting. Um, we do have a lot of questions, so I'll, I'll jump into them and, uh, and okay. we'll go from there. So hold on one second here. And I do have some links too, which I will, I'm also, I'll send the, the link of the, um, I know uh, carbon um, sequestering garden. I'll put that link in the the chat as well. I know you mentioned that right in the beginning. The um, it's a free booklet online that if you want to check out, it's a it's a great resource. So excellent. Yeah. Some of the stuff you might have covered a little bit, but I'll I'll, I'll ask the question anyhow. Uh, Edmund asks uh, first of all, he says, "Nice lecture. Uh, what guidance do you have with treating weeds in large vegetable gardens? Have you used salt hay, mulch, or soil barrier wrap successfully?" Uh, apparently, they travel often and during the growing season, uh, and upon returning, the garden weeds we seem to have taken over. So, mm. any guidance would be appreciated. Yeah. Um, so, weeds are, uh, I think, fascinating. So, there's a reason why they're there. Um, and there's lots of different types of weeds. Um, some are woody perennials, which are harder to, to kind of get rid of, and then some are annuals. Um, but oftentimes, they're responding to um, uh, some sort of nutrient deficiency or something in the soil. So they are trying to build succession from one layer to the next. So if you're noticing a certain type of weed, um, so, you know, mulching is a great way to kind of suppress them. Um, and sometimes a really thick mulch can help with that. Um, but again, if you can really focus on uh, building up or adding, say, like amendments, like um, like a nutrient-rich amendment, like rock dust or uh, sea, sea products, like so mulching with something like kelp, uh, from the beach or, um, or other, other pieces that have high levels of trace nutrients, um, you can actually sometimes bypass them. So an example uh, that I've seen um, is uh, lamb's quarters. It's uh, an edible weed that rivals spinach as well in nutrition, nutrient density. Um, and it, um, it's usually an indicator that you have a lot of um, organic matter, which is a good sign, but it's, it's a weed. So it's bacterially dominant soils. And as you kind of build up your soils, that lamb's quarters will get smaller and smaller. And eventually it's the one struggling. Um, and so I've literally seen weeds just disappear. And so as you're gardening and you're building up your soil, really look at what weeds communities are there. There's a very cool database, which I'll add a link to in the thing that actually you can type in the name of the weed and it'll tell you the nutrients that, um, 
it accumulates. Uh, and so you can see a, one way to do it, uh, get rid of those weeds is to actually take the weeds, ferment them in a bucket um, and make a fermented plant juice, wait till it stops smelling in like a you know bucket or a little yogurt container or whatever. And then literally just spray those weeds with the, um, the concentrated uh, fermented plant, essentially homemade fertilizer. Um, and, and you can get rid of weeds that way as well. So there's, um, some of them are longer term, uh, but mulching is a great way to do it as well. That's good to know. Also on the same vein, we had a question asking about uh, covering large open weedy lawns, um, which has full sun and so on. Yeah. Um, so again, like really, um, I think that, um, for lawns in particular, I think, uh, Part of the thing is just making sure that you have air and water getting down deep. So, um, and then mixing in a variety of species. So for example, um, there's now a lot of wonderful eco lawn blends um, that have a lot of different grass species, not just one, and they have deeper roots. Um, also there are inoculants. So these are mycorrhizal fungal inoculants. So they're beneficial inoculants that um, you can get um, that are, it's like a powder form and a little bit goes a long way, but before you sprinkle your seed on, um, add some of this powder uh, that has a, uh, as, and get as a good inoculant is, um, and actually let me just write down here, I'll just write this down because, um, so it's mycorrhizal inoculant, um, but you're looking for one that has um, as large, uh, as many variety or as many species as you can um, and, um, a beneficial bacteria and fungi. And then it, you just need a tiny amount. Like, I think it's something like an ounce can be enough to inoculate, um, like a hundred pounds of farm seed. So it's, it's very, it's very effective. It's not just for nitrogen fixing, but it's for, it's adding resilience. So that, that piece, and that works really well with grasses. Another thing I would recommend is just go into your yard and pull up a plant and just see if you have any soil sticking to the roots. Um, and notice if there's soil sticking to the roots of the weeds or the plants that you want. And so that'll also tell you which one is kind of, act, you know, activating the soil biology. And so you can both bring soil biology in or try to increase it or by, so a number of things, either working with the plants, adding an inoculant or, um, or also just like sometimes if it's too compacted and there's not a lot going there. Um, look at that root structure of the weeds and see what they're doing. Do they have deep tap roots? Do they have spreading tap roots? What, what are they doing or what are they trying to do? So you can learn a lot from the landscape by looking at the weeds. Great. Thank you. What about um, a question here uh, about organic fertilizers? Uh, mm -hmm. What organic fertilizers or mulchers would you recommend? Is Espoma okay? Uh, what about organic wood chips or leaf mold? I guess it's uh, yes. Mike's, Mike's mulch. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. I think, um, yeah, all the, all those different pieces. Um, I know if you're able to get shredded leaf litter, that is amazing. It's actually a great way to grow small seedlings. Um, so like, or like straw dust. So if anyone who has animals or, um, other things, it, you know, the dust left over from hay bales is amazing as like a thin mulch around young seedlings. Um, you also, uh, yeah, I, I'd say a lot of organic all-purpose fertilizers, like there's um, ProGrow from North Country Organics, there's Epsoma, there's a lot of different ones, but those are all options. I think what you're looking for on the uh, fertilizer label is that NPK is just to be low. You don't want it to be like 20, 20, 20, or like I usually pick a very low number. So like five, three, two, something like that. Um, because you're, you don't want a lot of that number, those numbers represent soluble nutrients. And so you're blasting your plants. It doesn't incorporate all the nutrients that are in there. And the reason organic fertilizers are so good is they have a lot of slow release and that doesn't show up in that number. So you want some fast, but a, a lot of slow. So it feeds your microbes. Great. Thank you. Um, what about buffalo grass? Uh, could you, could that be mixed into existing grass? Yeah, yeah, there's actually, um, so Prairie Moon Nursery, and I'm sure there's others as well, but Prairie Moon Nursery is a native plant nursery slash uh, seed supplier, and they have an eco mix as well that I think has a whole mix of um, grasses, and these are still short growing like lawn grasses, some of them are very slow growing, um, but they, they do really well. Um, so looking, look up eco uh, lawn mixes, um, or also just um, native native grasses. Um, also, there's a bunch of sedges 
that are really drought hardy, beautiful um, leaves, shiny leaves. I think Pennsylvania sedge is one of them uh, that do really well and they're super drought hardy and, and do a lot better than Kentucky bluegrass. So. Okay, cool. Very nice. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Nancy wants to know what the best resources to find beneficial bugs on the Cape. Ah, beneficial bugs. Well, my favorite way is just um, planting some of their like high nectar producing uh, plants. Um, and then also uh, having, um, you know, a couple strategic overwintering sites, because if you can have them in place, uh, you can get them shipped in. Um, but there are issues sometimes with that. Like, for example, praying mantises, I think the variety they tend to ship is um, it's it's a non-native species that is very, very aggressive and eats everything. So the things like that. So so I, I oftentimes like to have my own kind of resource beetles also. Mounded native grasses are wonderful hiding places for um, beetles, which are your friends. Like they are unbelievable hunters. Also fireflies eat the larvae eat slugs. Who knew? Um, so like there's tons of different allies that you have in the garden, but again, habitat and nectar sources and pollen sources for as much of the year as possible. So that, that would be my, my recommendation. And there's a couple like mountain mint is one of them that is really amazing, but having different sources that are really high value and go to a garden center and just see which plants are thriving, like, like buzzing, um, and alive. Cause a lot of cultivars don't have a very high nectar content anymore. So they, they're not actually super helpful, unfortunately. So, so keep a lookout for that. Excellent. Uh, Pamela wants to know, uh, can you grow sun, uh, black sunflower seed of bird, of bird food? Uh, I think you can. Yeah. As long as it's not like irradiated or something, sometimes people will, um, to prevent like weevils or something, sometimes they, uh, irradiate it, but definitely try it. Um, the one thing I will say for sunflower, uh, just be mindful. So like, for example, having a bird feeder is a great way to attract nutrient cyclers, birds. Um, and it's a great way to bring a high nitrogen source, bird poop, to your landscape and, and break down leaves, for example. However, um, sunflower seeds, um, if you use tons and tons of sunflower seeds, the holes on sunflower seeds do inhibit seed germination. And so they sometimes, if you use, I have a lot of them, they can kind of inhibit things uh, in a similar way that like black walnut or eucalyptus or other things do. So just be aware of dumping tons of sunflower on it, but you totally try it, see if they sprout. Nice, nice. What about um, the space right under, underneath trees? Uh, do we try to disturb it? Do we not disturb it? Mm, um, yeah. If you're able to have, so like if you think about forest, forest communities, they oftentimes have a thick cover um, and they also oftentimes have not all trees, but a lot of trees, like I would go to the woods for inspiration and see what is growing around certain trees. Um, but oftentimes they do have an existing plant cover and what works really well is the trees will oftentimes have deep roots and then they'll have some surface level roots, but they, um, work with certain types of plants. And so, um, in urban or compacted environments, sometimes the tree roots are all at the top. So sometimes like, you know, if there's some way to get air flow deeper down, like so either a broad fork, a pitch fork, something to get air flow deeper down to get support for the trees deeper down to get those roots to spread out is a way to kind of allow things to be helpful, maybe build the soil up around it. Um, just be careful about that main trunk. You don't want to bury that. Um, but um, but yeah, so it's the shady, dry places are some of the hardest to work with. Um, so if you can get water or cover or something hardy under there, um, there are a bunch of native like ephemerals that do really well first thing in the spring before the leaves fill out. Um, but definitely take the woods for inspiration and see if you can find some examples of what naturally grows really well along there. Thank you. A um, few more questions here. I don't want to hold you up too much longer here, but let's see. James wants to know, uh, they have invasive uh, uh, yucca plants. Any tips on mm. soil treatments to counter uh, to counter them? Interesting. Yuc I yucca plants, yucca plants. I don't know if I'm Yeah. Oh, I don't know about those as much in terms of uh, as being invasive. So um, yeah, I think um, I would just say that, um, yeah, I think there's, well, there is one, 
one not okay so this is one option if you know kind of an alternative there, there are alternatives to things like roundup and other stuff and which i highly recommend um one of them is kind of a weird one it's a uh, boron or borax uh mixed with water or soap um so that one is uh boron is needed in super super tiny amounts in the soil and most soils in new england are really deficient in boron because it washes out of the soil very quickly and we have a lot of rain um, so unless you're in a greenhouse or something, or that's not getting a lot of rain, um, sometimes spot applying borax to these, um, these plants, like for example, like mixing it like a one-to-one -one water borax ratio and putting it right on the plants in the middle of full sun day is enough to kill some of those plants back, but add important levels of boron to the soil. Um, so it can overload a plant in the moment and you again need it in tiny amounts so you could try that if you wanted to sometimes also hot water boiling water or something like that is enough to take out a plant um but um yeah so there's a couple different options there it depends on kind of where it is and what how how pesky it is um as well you can dig it out as well thank you um richard wants to know uh, what would you recommend for planting under norway maple trees uh with many surface roots I guess this, the lawn doesn't do well at all due to the roots and the deep shade. Yeah, Norway maples are particularly tricky. I have seen them go um, into raised beds. I've seen them actually go into pots like and actually get pot bound inside, like the roots come up from the bottom into a tiny little hole in the bottom of a pot and just go straight up and fill the pot with roots. So they are very, very aggressive. Um, one thing you could try, um, because they're so aggressive, they also are fairly hardy to, um, I mean, it depends on how big the tree is too, but they are also fairly hardy to kind of the roots being um, disturbed a little bit. And so you could try sinking, and again, it depends on the site, but um, you could try like kind of um, like a, cutting the roots a little bit in a certain area um, and then planting into it and kind of letting things get established. But again, it's really, it, that's, a, that's I think one of the hardest places. There are a couple resources that um, help with um, dry soil and shady areas, but those I think are by far the hardest to get things established. And so again, early springtime when you have that sun before, I think it's bef like end of April, beginning of May, sometimes there's this window um, where you get, um, where you get a lot of sun. So spring ephemerals are a really wonderful option um, to get something sort of established. Uh, and then you can kind of add to it from there. So there's a lot of wonderful ones for, for New England uh, woods as well. Good, thank you. Um, last two questions. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously last summer, we had like a lot of hot summer days, very little rain. Um, so when you have large weedy lawns, uh, what do you recommend if you're not getting the rain? Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that um, I would strongly recommend is um, I think if if you're able to increase, so you know, one thing that's great for learning your soil is dig a hole um, and just see how deep your topsoil layer is. And um, I think one of the best things you can possibly do is building your soil in place um, so that you can kind of increase that sponge content. Uh, for your soil. Um, sometimes that might look like also, you know, another option is to get a soil test and just see if you're missing any major nutrients. So one nutrient that is oftentimes missing is uh, calcium and another one is like sulfur. Both of those are really, really important for one is protein development. The other is kind of plant development as well. Um, so some of those things, like for example, sometimes gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, is a really great soil conditioner that helps kind of loosen up compacted soils, uh, especially if you're calcium deficient. Um, but it's like one of those things where you can, or also some of these micronutrient sources can help um, activate some of that microbiology. There are also a lot of wonderful, uh, really high functioning, uh, full bodied uh, composts that have a whole range of microbes in them. So for example, if you have very bacterially dominant lawns, um, it's usually bacteria, a predator of bacteria are protozoa. Um, and so adding a diverse compost, sprinkling it in can be really helpful for jumpstarting that biology, a compost tea like that, or something like alfalfa meal, which has, it's a great way to encourage protozoa 
It has the same uh, nitrogen to carbon ratio as protozoa. And so it's a really, really great option for adding soil. It helps build soil structure. But then as soon as you get protozoa, you have bacteria, you get the protozoa, and then protozoa are a favorite food of earthworms. Um, and so they're oftentimes an indicator of a more complex uh, soil food web or biology. Uh, there's also beneficial nematodes, fungi, all these other things. But that, so um, alfalfa meal is another way to sometimes jumpstart um, biology. Um, so those are a couple different options for ways to do it. So you can do it minerally, biologically, kind of all of the above is great. But, you know, for a large area, that can be tricky. So um, even like uh, plant extracts. So like really, really even taking some of those weeds, soaking and fermenting them, and then spraying that water over the plants is a way to sort of... Um, do their job for them a little faster or get that nutrient, those nutrients cycling faster. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And finally, um, what was the name of the company that sells the eco lawn mix? Oh, uh, I'll write it in the chat. So this one, uh, there's, I'm sure there's other ones too. Um, but one that I just saw recently was, uh, it's Prairie Moon Nursery. Um, and they're in, I think Minnesota. I know there's some on the East East Coast as well, but they have a they have an eco lawn mix. Um, but looking up, just googling eco lawn mix, and I also will send the uh, just the link for the Dr. Duke's database. It's a USDA database for if you want to nerd out on what nutrients your plants are hyper accumulating. Um, that's a very fun one. You can type in the common name or scientific name, and it's it's a lot of information. But if you really want to dive in, it's it's a very fun way to see what your plants are telling you about your landscape and what it needs. Wow, a wonderful lecture. We're getting a lot of wonderful comments. I loved your, your passion, uh, a lot of information. Thank you very much for taking the time out in Philadelphia to talk to us here in Cape Cod and share your wealth of knowledge. We really appreciate it. Well, I'm um, so. so excited to share it. And thank you again for, for having me. And also, um, I just really hope you have a wonderful uh, gardening year. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank, thank you, you, everybody, for sharing. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone.